Hi, this is Bob Brown, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today is Saturday, December 10th, 2016. And for those who may not know, I'd like to introduce a uh, person that could have changed the course of history but didn't. And this was the man that he's the proverbial voice crying in the wilderness. And he's a Swedish diplomat. His name is Hans Blix. And you may not know him, but believe me, at one time he was trying to prevent a massive destruction that we call the Iraq War, and no one listened to him. I'm going to read off his Wikipedia here. He was born in, on, he was born in 1928. He's a Swedish diplomat. He's a member of the Liberal People's Party of Sweden. And he's most notable for his Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission. Uh, he was the head of the advisory board for the United Arab Emirates Nuclear Program. Uh, what, he was on the Weapons of Mass Destruction Committee since 2003. Blix had been chairman for the Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission, an independent body funded by the Swedish government and based in Stockholm. In December 2006, Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission said in a report that Pakistan's nuclear science scientist Abdul Qadir Khan could not have acted alone or without the awareness of Pakistan government. So uh, Hans Blix is basically, um, he was part of the Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission. He was kind of a, he was a, he's a straight shooter, um, and he was on the commission that went into Iraq prior to the Iraq invasion to see if the Iraqis actually had weapons of mass destruction. And it became apparent to Hans Blix and his team that Saddam Hussein's forces did not have weapons of mass destruction. They did not have nuclear weapons, they didn't have bioweapons, they had a lot of conventional explosive weapons, they had a lot of weapons that you know that were extremely dangerous but they're more of the conventional weapons of perhaps the World War II era extremely dangerous they were had tanks uh, armaments howitzers guns galore but they didn't have weapons of mass destruction and that was the argument that the CIA had given to President George Bush the second to President George Bush the second that there, Saddam posed an existential threat to the United States and the rest of the world because of, they had weapons of mass destruction. The CIA uh, uh, famously at that time pointed out that it was a slam dunk, Mr. President, they have these weapons. And then they, the Iraq war built up under the neoconservatives and the Iraq war was on. And you should read up about Hans Blix and what he said. Hans Blix said very clearly, he goes, you can't trust the Iraqi government. You can't trust the Iraqis what, they, what they're telling you. But he said very clearly, his team has found no evidence whatsoever. And of course, Hans Blix and his team were proven right. There were no weapons of mass destruction. Iraq fell into a total disarray. You know, thousands of U.S. servicemen and women lost their lives. It's estimated by the United Nations that almost one million Iraqis, due to the Iraq invasion, destabilization of that region, have taken place. I bring up this video in a business, on a business channel with leadership because it's very important to understand people that are trying to give you a message. I mean, too often we listen to the messages that fulfill our biases. I think in the case of President George Bush II, there were, there were indications that Saddam Hussein had plotted to kill the Bush family, including Laura Bush. And that, you know, you're naturally not going to like someone who's trying to kill your wife and family. So you have an extreme bias against these uh, the, the Iraqis. And no one's saying Saddam Hussein was a good person because he wasn't. But the question really remains is why wasn't Hans Blix and his team taken seriously? Why did the CIA know more than Hans Blix and his people? And Hans Blix and his people were on the ground in Iraq. Now, the CIA may have had operatives in there. They may have informants. But they weren't trained scientists like Blix's team was. I think that shows... It's, it's human jealousy, I think, is the problem. Because there's a natural propensity that happens that sometimes that people are jealous of people of education. I think that's brought on by the educated people themselves, is that if you act arrogant towards people because of your privilege of having education, that kind of stains everybody. So as a professor of mine once chided me for, 
you know, he said to me, Brown, he said, you remember, you're privileged to be sitting in that chair getting, at that time, your master's degree. He says, you're privileged. He goes, very few people have that privilege. And that stuck with me because I would made an offhand remark about, you know, people in general. And it really disturbed him. He's an African-American professor, and it disturbed him. I, I, I really didn't say anything racialist or anything. It was just kind of an off-the-cuff comment about Hoosiers, and I, and I live in Indiana. And that really bothered him. He said, Brown, he said, you're showing a, a, dis, uh, a tendency towards er, ed, ed, intellectual arrogance. He goes, and I don't want to see that. He goes, you're privileged to be sitting in that chair. He said, because you're in that chair, he said, you have the opportunity that millions and maybe billions of people will never have. And that really, that struck me. That really impacted me. It changed my way of thinking. So I think in one way, to, so that scientists... This goes from climate scientists who, you know, there are people denying that there's climate change problems to pollution problems to, you know, Hans Blix and his team were being ignored. I think the first thing that we as, I'm a social scientist, what we need to do is turn down the arrogance factor by about 100%. We need to reach people. We need to start with the basics. We need to engage them. We need to show them the evidence. We need to show them why science really should trump opinion, why science really should trump, you know, feelings. Because if we don't use facts and science to solve these world problems, we're, we're going to be in a world of hurt. That's just flat truth. I said in a lot of videos we live in a post-fact world. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean I like the idea that we live in a post-fact world. It's, it's that... It's that you'll see as you, as you work on this. So I'm sitting here working on my doctoral program right now. You'll see as you go through that people, the more educated you get, there's kind of this perversity of life, the less people will listen to you. I, I guarantee it. And it's because intellectual snobbery, and, and not all intellectuals are snobs, but has really got a lot of what I'll call the lay people, the average person, in a defensive crouch when, when intellectuals, academics start talking. Remember, the one thing you learn as you go up the ladder in education, the first thing you're going to learn is how much every step shows you how much you don't know and how much you will never know. It's not like how much I know. It's really how, the, the, the goal of education really is, is the inverse. It shows you how much you don't know how much you don't realize, how much you'll never know. That's reality. I mean, I study complexity science for, on the interaction between people and cybernetic technology. And believe me, that field alone, I, it could take 100 lifetimes to even maybe figure some of it out. So I don't say that Hans Blick's team was arrogant. I say there's a, we, we have built into society a suspicion of science. We have built into society a suspicion of intellectuals. We have built into society a suspicion of reason. I think in a way that's why the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock Holmes is so wildly popular. Because Sherlock Holmes is kind of like the person who's looking at a world full of opinion and biases and, and, and illusion and, mis, and misdirection. And he's using logic and observation to find the answer. I think that's why his Sherlock Holmes is so popular or Robert Downey Jr.'s version is so popular. It's about finding these answers. So we've got to make science relative to people. We've got to turn down the, the, you know, the level. When I, when I deal with people, I, I always, I, you know, I don't, I don't throw my credentials in front of them. I don't throw arrogance in front of them. I try to show them that, well, here's what I learned and I'm sharing it with you. Let me share with you what I know. I, it doesn't mean what I know is right, but it doesn't mean it's wrong either. But we can come to an understanding. Because the tragedy of Hans Blick's team is that because people did not listen to science, reason, and on-the-ground observation, the United States blundered into an ill-fated war that resulted in countless loss, losses of American lives, I believe thirty to 40,000 wounded, PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder for the, the American troops is, is in the hundreds of thousands. The massive destruction of 
life in Iraq. The UN, some estimates are as high as one million people have died because of the result of that. That's one million people. How, how do you make up for that? I, I, don't, I don't even know. I, I mean, what do you do? What you, you can't do anything to bring back the dead, but what you can do is says from now on, we're going to use science, reason, discussion, logic. Those are going to be our go-to tool set, not opinion, bias, m you know, media spin. So, you know, we, when you're teaching, make sure you show people that science is the way to think. It's logic is the way to think. Beliefs are important. I'm not discounting beliefs. But at the end of the day, reason and science are things that everyone, regardless of their belief, regardless of their biases, regardless of their opinions, have to start agreeing upon. This has been Bob Brown, and thank you for watching my videos. And remember, as always, keep studying.